So I hope we're on the same side, actually. And thanks to, um, to Mark for the kind invitation, for letting me talk a little bit about our work. And um, today I'm going to focus on the work that we do on mycobacterial pathogens. We work on the interface between the host and the environment. And really, my interests are what happens to the pathogen when he's outside of the host. I shouldn't say he there, it is outside of the host. And, um, and how does that impact on transmission and, and the epidemiological aspects? So just to say that all the data and the um, conclusions that I'm going to present are a result of a close collaboration between myself as an environmental microbiologist and uh, Oren Courtney, who is the epidemiological expertise in all of these studies. So, um, what is the problem and why is the environment important? You'd think, is it uh, obligate mycobacterial pathogens? And we've just heard a very nice uh, presentation from Emily about issues with TB diagnosis. And there's also, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, the animal version of the disease, which is bovine TB, and currently a hot topic in the UK because of the problem in the wildlife reservoirs. And so I thought, as it was topical, it would be nice to explore a little bit that um, the data there and the work we're doing to help or um, not necessarily always give the right answer that the, the government are looking for, but at least to try and help in the problem of the disease of BTB. So uh, mycobacteria um, forms two kind of groups. There's two groups within the genus, and they're slow growers and fast growers. Slow growers are mostly pathogenic. Uh, not all of them, but that's where the pathogens are. And the slow growers have a, a number of diagnostic attributes, one of which is an insertion sequence in a 16S um, signature gene. So that's handy. And the two main uh, offenders, really, in the, in the disease uh, that is um, tuberculosis are uh, Mycobacterium bovis and tuberculosis. Uh, Bovis has a wider host range, is a more recently uh, evol evolved uh, um, uh, from the progenitor organisms uh, that uh, tuberculosis has, has evolved from. And so uh, human, probably human tuberculosis evolved first, uh, and then this uh, went off. Both organisms show reductive uh, uh, evolution, so they show a lot of... Um, deletions in the genome, and that's very useful for di the diagnoses. So uh, what are the problems? Okay, there are, there are a number of problems here, one of which is cultivation. Uh, when I say slow growing, I mean slow growing. So E. coli uh, can replicate and double its population within about 30 minutes. Mycobacteria, uh, bovis or tuberculosis, or any of the slow growing complex, you're talking about days really. And you're lucky to see, for a wild type isolate, uh, a, a, a colony within um, eight weeks. So major problems in what is the gold standard for uh, TB diagnosis, which is cultivation. And of course, that is the case for most um, uh, uh, infectious diseases that involve bacteria. Is it, Obviously, traditional cultivation was the gold standard and still remains so in many parts of the world. And, um, and so, for our purposes, we have something to compare to when we're using molecular methods to look at population level infection and environmental contamination. So, that's an issue. And there are methods to speed that up, which are used for diagnostic purposes, but um, these are, are still problematic in, in parts of Africa. So, and when you're doing research, you haven't got time to wait so long. Uh, you need something fast. You can improve um, your, your recovery from dirty samples. So issues with cultivation here relate to competition. And so you have to make the system very selective. And if you're trying to isolate an organism from outside of its host, it's in a sort of shutdown state. It might be compromised. It's trying to survive. And so it probably doesn't react and respond to the same 
uh, way in which uh, an actively uh, fast-growing organism in, in, a, um, in a tissue sample would do. So often, isolating from soil set feces doesn't give you, using traditional methods, doesn't give you any result. So obviously, as, as pointed out in the previous talk by Emily, molecular diagnostics, molecular detection, and that, these are the tools that the molecular environmental microbiologist has, has really made uh, their own because we're able to go in to environments where we couldn't cultivate organisms and now we can find them. It doesn't mean to say we can cultivate them yet, but we certainly know that they're there. And a lot of the work we're doing is, is trying to find out what the physiological status of those organisms outside of the host is. And this is a, a sort of lifelong application, really, uh, especially with these organisms. So that's the, uh, the problem. The, the major issue with um, the bovine TB, which I'm going to focus on more, I will mention a bit about human, but it's mostly bovine with environmental contamination, is that there are wildlife reservoirs, replicating reservoirs. So these are not endpoint hosts. They are actively uh, replenishing infection. So as much as you try to control infection in, say, livestock populations of cattle, sheep, deer, whatever, you are still um, hampered by in ingress infection from, from wildlife. And, of course, we know the uh, supposed um, wrongdoer in the situation in the UK are, are the badgers. And so... Uh, Mealy Means is um, a member uh, of that group, and um, they are supposedly, um, and there's a fair amount of evidence now that they are co-infected with the same SNP types as, um, as the uh, livestock in the neighboring area. So the, 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 the directionality of transmission is still difficult and probably will never be fully established, but there are certain pointers that can indicate which way it's going. And then across the world, the main problem areas with this issue, Australia, uh, where there's introduced water buffalo, America, the white-tailed deer is a major <coughs> reservoir, and of course the bison, which is a protected animal, but it keeps, actually, the transmission is coming from the deer and the, and the livestock. And so they try to protect bison and they re-release them and they get reinfected. So actually their numbers, whilst they are dramatically reduced through hunting, um, are really getting further reduced through disease. And then finally, in Africa, where we do quite a lot of work, it's the African buffalo. And that is a major, regarded as a major replicating reservoir which can infect um, large cats and um, the giraffes and, and hippos and a range of other animals. So environmental contamination, where does this come into the picture and how does it really impact on transmission? And um, are indeed uh, the cells in, in the environment, are they infectious? And so um, the, uh, the point that we're, we're trying to consider is, is not just the environment as a source of infection, but also as an indicator of disease. So that can help you understand with the wildlife population. And what we wanted to do and have managed to do is to develop a non-invasive, and by being non-invasive, I mean totally non-invasive, no blood, uh, nothing that requires capturing the organism. We simply focus on the feces and some of the surroundings, so maybe watering holes, surrounding land, sets, burrows, that kind of thing. So, um, and with uh, the um, organism, because it infects the uh, respiratory tract, the thorax, <laughs> we're fortunate in that most animals don't, um, <clears throat> unlike us, they don't really spit, apart from camels, uh, they swallow. So, um, <laughs> on that rather indelicate point, I'll continue and uh, explain that when they cough up a lot of cells, when they're heavily infected, uh, they swallow it. So, um, 
that's uh, why it then, because of its thick, waxy um, outer coating, mycobacteria is resistant to the digestive system and it just passes through and so can be recovered in feces. And we spent, had to spend a lot of time actually proving that, uh, and that's, that was actually a huge amount of work. Direct transmission is by aerosol and biting in the case of cattle and badgers, and that's what I'm going to focus on just now. It's a big um, area of public concern. The badger is our biggest surviving uh, carnivorous mammal. Everything, it's got no predators apart from the car. And, um, and there's obviously been a lot of opposition to the recent attempt uh, at culling. Um, and this, this, the culls being rolled out at the moment are not to de control disease, but they're to determine that it's possible to do um, a, a humane type of uh, population reduction. And um, just to prove that we are hip, um, the badger um, uh, fraternity protect the badgers have produced a rap. So I'd love to play it now, but it will engross on my time and I'll get the horrible klaxon treatment. So, um, but it, it just Google um, uh, badger, uh, so it's called the badger swagger. And it's a rather ghastly um, combination of the talents of Brian May from Queen and somebody called Slash from Guns and Roses. So there you go. <laughs> we can play it in the coffee break if you like. Anyway, um, so we, we've got to try and solve this problem because uh, we, we love our, our wildlife. We've got very little of it left. Um, but of course, we, we are losing huge amounts of money, millions and millions of pounds in compensation for farmers when they have to um, obviously cull their herds and they have to um, uh, remove reactor animals that are positive uh, for bovine TB. I'm not, I'm not going to focus too much because it takes too long on the molecular methods, just to say that the reduction in genome has presented us with an ideal target for looking at scar regions and regions of difference between all the different genomes in the mycobacterial tuberculosis complex. So these are highly uh, related complex of pathogens and we can segregate bovis very readily both from BCG by doing an RD1 scar and from tuberculosis and other members of the complex by doing an RD4 scar, as you can see, these differences here. And there are also other uh, genes that are exclusive. And we have to make sure that we have high sensitivity, high specificity. Um, we've done thousands of PCRs to establish that, and it's all been validated up to um, OIE standards. So um, our main target for um, study is uh, this delightful stuff. And um, we've got an expert on badger poo right over there sitting in the audience there. So David Porter has been working with me on badgers for many years, <laughs> very many years. And um, he's also a, a wildlife expert. So. Um, he's a brilliant person to take on trips to Africa because he's able to identify virtually everything. So um, the, uh, this is just an example, and obviously you can uh, use lots of tags so that you can get differential expression. Ultimately, we'd love to come up with some field methods to track uh, feces, and we're looking currently at um, a phage-based method with catharese in, in Nottingham. We need, uh, in terms of um, diagnostic capability, uh, to avoid um, these false negatives. And so we want to be working around this area, 95% confidence. Our test sensitivity is about 5%. So it's got a point, point, sorry, it's about 0.5. There's 0.5 p-value. And we focus on taking replicates of about 10, because this gets us below that. Uh, below that critical point there for um, reliability. So we've estimated all this in an initial collaboration with the Republic of Ireland where they did roll out a major cull and we worked with Eamon Gormley and others at UCD and we were able to then um, establish a correlation 
between the amount of um, shedding, tracheal shedding, the number of legion, lesions in the, um, in the badger, and the load based on uh, qPCR. So we actually have a very good uh, correlation. So tracheal sh shedding correlates with fecal shedding. And that's what you'd predict, but you have to prove it to establish that it's a reliable um, method uh, of detection. And uh, in this case, load. Um, and we find that the qPCR value correlates with gross uh, load in terms of the uh, pathology. And this was done on, on animals sacrificed in the uh, Republic of Ireland, where badgers are they're protected in the UK. Uh, they're not protected in Ireland, so um, badger, uh, badger culling is allowed. They have the same level of problem as, as we do. And in the UK, uh, the main problem, um, can't actually see it on this, the main problem is that uh, the west side, and there's a sort of edge region down the middle of the UK, the west side is where all the infection occurring. Uh, in terms of the budget population, and also in terms of the breakdowns of um, bovine TP in dairy, dairy and, and other uh, livestock, but mostly dairy cattle. Our question here is, what does it tell us about the infection status of the badgers? So a non-invasive method of sampling of wildlife is a fantastically powerful tool when you're looking at health um, of a particular um, wildlife reservoir and um, obviously trapping and testing, even taking bloods is incredibly expensive, time consuming and has a low uh, chance, low sensitivity because it's, um, it, your catch up is, is poor. Um, most of our, our work um, subsequently from the Irish work, although we're still working in Ireland, is in uh, Gloucester at a place called Winchester Park where the AHVLA have their field site, um, which is a, a series of um, uh, social groups of badgers that have been monitored over many years. So it's a, a phenomenal scientific resource. All the animals have been genotyped, um, and they are, those are updated. And um, this work is done in collaboration with Des Delahaye. So we are looking at um, the way in which we sample a number of social groups in this area and how that relates, the method of sampling relates to the correlation with um, pathology of animals in terms of positivity when trapped. So these animals are not killed, but they are trapped and tested for um, the immunoassay and uh, skin testing. And the results, uh, these are Provisional results, so we are writing them up at the moment, uh, show that in terms of shedding, um, we are seeing that only a small number of the social groups that we've monitored are responsible for a large amount of the shedding, which is the sort of idea in epidemiology of the, of the sort of 2080 rule, where 20% of the population are responsible for the majority of infectivity and transmission. So this is actually a very important point and could help in terms of control. And if we look across the seasons, so in Winchester, we studied the problem across uh, four seasons. And um, you'll see that the load in terms of qPCR and the feces doesn't vary really very much. However, the distribution is skewed to a small proportion of sets. And that, uh, obviously, um, you can see that the actual load is not very with the, with the seasons, but it is with the sets. So again, that's this sort of 2080 rule. And there you can see the, the change over the years and the bubble plot down here, which gives you a precise uh, indication of the kind of six uh, areas or six social groups that we attribute uh, most of the, the load to. And we're now um, doing all the uh, correspondence analysis with the work on the 
traditional cultivation and all the other tests, which are the clinical based tests, from trapping the animals. And so here um, you can see that about sort of roughly 17%, these are not the final data set, but around 17% of the animals, so about half of the animals, are testing positive that are caught, and around about sort of 20%, a bit less, are shedding. And we would regard shedding as a method of transmission. So that correlates with tracheal shedding and aerosol transmission as well as biting. So that does relate very much to transmissibility. And as Mark pointed out, we're very lucky now to be able to, um, to collaborate with his group and all the expertise that's there. And uh, clearly we have a lot of feces and um, it's going to be fantastic to try and get genomes from these feces. And the first attempt was partially successful in getting, as, as Mark mentioned, two and a half times coverage uh, from about six, I think it was six gig. So um, we'd like to continue with that work. And in addition, we can do traditional uh, movement analysis um, by looking at microsatellites. So you can do microsatellites on badger hair, and um, people like Terry Burke at Sheffield have pioneered that work. But you can, we've actually done a method for multiplexing from fecal DNA and getting a, a microsatellite profile from that. So it's going to be a sort of uh, poo who done it story about working out which badger has done which uh, poo and how, what's the level of infection. So this all is hopefully going to help to solve the problem of how transmission is going on between badgers and maybe what are good mitigation intervention strategies. And on that note, the um, vaccination uh, research has taken uh, a lot of um, uh, positive movements ahead this year. And a number of papers indicated that both the uh, oral uh, application route and the intramuscular injection route work well to protect badgers against uh, bovine TB. Obviously, if you're thinking long term and you look at other disease, diseases in way in wildlife control, disease control in wildlife, uh, food baiting is, tends to be the best way in which to um, administer it. Uh, to large populations of animals where you don't know exactly where they are and you can't trap them readily. And, um, and clearly the oral work, which was done by the Irish groups, that the idea is, is ultimately to develop a food bait and there's currently a lot of research going on there. Uh, our work has looked at the correlation between vaccination in the trial and shedding in faeces. And what you see is, in fact, uh, three areas. The way in which the Irish did it is to have an area of 50-50, um, half animals vaccinated, half not, and then two areas where no, no vaccination and all vaccinated. Now, I'm pointing, but in fact, it was all done blinded. Everything we do is, is barcoded and blinded, so we, we don't actually know what we're dealing with. So we know this is 50-50, but we don't know which one of these but we're hoping um, that that is the one that's been vaccinated because this is the, in terms of the um, uh, level of, of shedding, um, that is the uh, positivity um, is for that A, A region, say, compared to C region. And so actually you can see there that if vaccination dramatically reduced shedding, then that is the mode of, the primary mode of transmission. It could be highly effective, and it certainly, if rolled out with a limited amount of culling, might be the solution. And so that's something. <coughs> Obviously, there's a lot of debate, and there's been a large amount of research done by Krebs et al. and many other um, experts in epidemiology. And because um, they're very territorial, culling in badges is problematic because it encourages movement. So if you reduce numbers in one area, area, then other animals will, will encroach and come in. And they may well have then um, infection from inhabiting, you know, contaminated uh, burrows, sets and so on. 
So uh, the idea is, is to sort of try and, and uh, modeling has suggested this, is a, a car with a ring vaccination. And um, the hope is, is that Owen Patterson um, will consider that. I'll just very briefly now give you two other examples of the work we're doing in Africa. And um, one is, is, um, is a multi-center collaboration funded by the NIH, which is looking at reservoirs of uh, bovine TB and human TB in the, in the environment. And you see that the picture is very similar, except you've got slight differences in that um, with the cattle, they're not sacrificed when positive, um, even when they, they know the animals are positive because there's no compensation. And the pastoralists uh, consume, even though they're, they're told uh, to boil it, unboiled milk. They also drink this sort of strawberry milk shape, which is a mixture of milk and blood. And uh, yeah, I haven't tried it actually. So um, it's sort of a lethal concoction, especially if the animal's infected. And they eat raw meat as well. And of course, there's very intimate contact. They live with their animals. And so um, you can see that they live in these villages with little homesteads. And the animals will be just milling around. So a number of um, projects that we're also trying to initiate is in the parks in Africa, in the Ruha and the Kruger, uh, where there's a lot of concern about the prevalence of bovine TB. And of course, cats are particularly sensitive. They're an M end reservoir. They're an endpoint. They're not a replication reservoir. But they'll often pick off animals, buffalo, that are diseased, so they're slower moving. And so they're more likely to contract infection, and that will kill them. So in our one of our sites, we're next to the Ruha region. So this is a source of potential reservoir, uh, replicating reservoir, where the buffalo is. And then there's a, a, um, a river here. And then we've got all the villages along here. And then the, the livestock, uh, which is the Zebus uh, cattle here. And so we're looking at, um, so the medics in America are looking at human TB across a, a community-wide study, which is over 1,000 patients. And we're looking at a limited number of villages where we've got pastoralists and they've got animals and we're looking at environmental contamination, levels in the animals and um, if we're lucky we may well in time be able to get the data on the humans there as well. Um, there are a lot of ethical issues with this. So uh, two regions then um, that we have, this is all in Tanzania, um, in uh, um, the Paguala and the Adobe and uh, six villages uh, with five homesteads uh, in each and sampling water locations as well where they take the animals for watering, particularly in dry season because the water levels get very reduced and of course contaminated with feces and so on. And taking a lot of metadata, making sure we know exactly where we sample so we can go back. We know the size of the herds, uh, what they're doing with the animals, what's happening in the homesteads, the type of farming, and um, a whole a range of other data about these, uh, the surrounding areas and the sample sites, it's kind of metadata. At the moment, we're still in the progress of this, we've got another currently in the uh, third or five year project, and we have about 10.8% overall prevalence in feces, which is, is actually, um, encouragingly, quite low. We thought it would be higher than that. and. Um, and using, this is our, our Embovis method. And if we look o over the distribution, we can see that um, putative is where you don't get all three replicates coming up in terms of your actual PCR. So you have to go back and retest and retest. Um, and so uh, cattle and goats. What is interesting here is that goats uh, are, in the, are a reservoir as well. So they're getting in, infected too. Um, and uh, in some of the cases, you can see in Kitsisi, there's very high level in the cattle. And this group didn't have any goats. I wonder if um, the goats all died from TB, I don't know. Uh, and just the community-wide study, uh, the data's uh, much slower to come in. We've got many more 
samples there, and um, there's a naught missing there. It should be, it's not 50, <laughs> it should be 500. Um, and we've got a case, case control. And so of all the, um, we found nothing in the controls in terms of the dust. So we're just looking at the environment. But around about 40% of the dust in the positives shows high levels and, and quite a high count, up to 10 to the 7, in the dust in, their, in the houses or the huts or wherever they're living, and just outside. And they, they tend to spit a lot, obviously, just outside the house, but that's inside as well. And then finally, just to finish off, to give you um, a further example of um, a situation in Ethiopia where we did very um, similar studies in terms of monitoring uh, environmental load. But here we looked at um, diversity as well, um, or I won't talk about that, but slow-growing microbacteria. We can use phy uh, this phylotyping of Amplicon 16S. But if we now develop a finer level analysis involving oligotyping, which is the, the frequency of use of different um, uh, base pairs in the Amplicon, you can actually segregate um, at the sort of sub-generic level. Um, and we, we've tested that. So what you can see here is this is from the 454 of the Amplicon analysis. And in the sort of crimson, you can see where we're getting. This is complex. So you can't segregate these because they have identical 16S. But that's where we're getting complex. And you can see that there's also a lot of other slow-growing microbacteria around. Um, and this is also useful because there's some thought that the problem of efficacy of the BCG vaccine in humans in, in Africa relates to environmental um, exposure to uh, serotype cross-reacting uh, other slow-growing microbacteria. It seems very likely the load is, is quite high there. And if we look overall, at this, if we look at the power sequencing, it correlates very nicely with the molecular, very specific qPCR. And you can see there that um, we've got correlation and we find more bovis in the water samples than we did in the soil. And we think there that a lot of the problems, um, and they, the pastoralists uh, have very high level of uh, BTB. They have one of the highest levels in um, in the world of um, of that of the disease um, is coming from using the water for drinking, washing, uh, as well as for watering the cattle, and they have very small, uh, dirty watering holes, and it w would be possible to have a an intervention strategy there. So finally, I'd like I hope that's not overshot too badly. Uh, to thank you for your attention and. Um, to give really a massive thanks to collaborators and co-workers um, who are vast and many, but um, in terms of the microbacteria work, obviously uh, David, um, Andrew, Haley is doing the microsatellite working work on, um, on the uh, Woodchester population. Uh, Arch is doing the, uh, with David, doing the Tanzanian work. Um, Phil James, uh, you can see here that we've... Um, We've uh, recruited Owen Patterson to help screen because this, he realizes with the badger issue such a big problem. So uh, he actually asked to come and get in the lab, get a lab coat on. He lasted about five minutes. And, um, uh, and there he is holding forth. Um, and then Tanya, who did a lot of the Ethiopian work, and of course, Orin Courtney. And finally, all our collaborators and funders uh, to allow us to carry on studying this interesting area. Thanks very much.